What it do? Dream Team, it's your boy D Neil back with another reaction video, guys. Here we are with the incredible stories of Britain's bravest soldiers, Victoria Cross for Valor. And before we jump into this, guys, make sure you jump into that subscribe button, ring notification bell, give the video a thumbs up so it gets suggested. Social media and Patreon are all up top. You want to subscribe to any of it? Put all the links in the description. All you got to do is hit the link, follow me, talk to me. Human. I talk back. Uh, and this is a much longer video, obviously, uh, than I'm used to reacting to. So we are going to break this down into like 20 minute parts. Uh, and this is a Patreon request from Chris. So shout out to Chris for this one. You guys got a favorite video suggestion? You can subscribe to Patreon or drop it in the comment section. Oh, we go! One of the great privileges of working at History Hit and making films together with our team at Timeline is the access we get to extraordinary historical locations like this one, Stonehenge. I'm right in the middle of the stone circle now. It is an absolutely extraordinary place to visit. If you want to watch the documentary like the one we're producing here, go to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix for history. And if you use the code TIMELINE when you check out, you'll get a special introductory offer. See you there. I might have to check that out, my guy. In September of 1944, the Allied armies were advancing fast towards Germany. But a huge obstacle stood in their way. The River Rhine. An audacious plan to capture eight of the bridges across it in one fell swoop started well. But everything went disastrously wrong with the final quarry. The bridge at Arnhem. Went down at this bridge, man. Now I'm hooked. That that little intro drew me in for sure. Twelve thousand airborne troops came by glider and parachute to fight for the bridge. Twelve thousand? Oh my God! It was the biggest airborne assault ever. Bro, my lord! But it didn't work. No way. Definitely, uh, man, you definitely have to pay your respects to those that have fallen. Uh, I believe fighting for your country and putting your life on the line is one of the bravest things you can do. But not only are you putting your life on the line, like you're sacrificing time away from family, you're sacrificing your mental health because even when you do survive a war, it's not like you come back the same as you were when you left. It's, it's very rare that you come back the same, that the war doesn't change you in some way, shape, or fashion. And so, uh, dude, anyone who's fought uh, definitely deserve respect, as well as the families of those who have fought, uh, to, to, to have to give up their partner or have to give up their parent and not know if they're going if, if to make it back. That, that not knowing, man... Uh, I just, I can't imagine it. I cannot imagine it. But keep it going. That's crazy. 12,000. In fact, it would turn out to be one of the biggest disasters in the entire war. Of the 12,000 men who came here, only 3,900 got out again. However, the battle produced some of the most astonishing feats of bravery in British military history. Hmm. One of the men fighting here was Major Robert Kane of the South Staffordshire Regiment. He arrived in the war zone by glider on September the 18th, just another ordinary man who'd given up his ordinary job to fight in the war. But. Ten days after his glider landed in this very field, this ordinary man would have done something extraordinary. He would have won the world's highest award for valour, hmm. the Victoria Cross. Oh, wow. That is gorgeous. That cross is absolutely beautiful. It's absolutely majestic, for sure. Sheesh. Wow. 
It is almost impossible to win a VC. In the 150 years since it was created, the number of British and Commonwealth troops who've seen action is in the tens of millions. But only 1,351 of them have been awarded the Victoria Cross. 1,351 out of tens of millions. When he said, he says almost impossible to win, like that's absolutely true. Like 1,300 out of tens of millions. That's 151 yeah. of them have been awarded the Victoria Cross. Yeah, that's almost impossible for sure. The chances of surviving a VC action are just one in ten. But if you do survive, the medal can never be taken away from you. You can go I to the gallows so. wearing it. And no matter how many letters you have after your name, VC always comes first. The VC, to my mind, has a place above all other national awards. It is the highest regarded award for gallantry. People have it in their minds that the Victoria Cross is something special, and anybody who's got the Victoria Cross must be somebody special, and they're right. Sure. I could have centered this program sure. on any VC winner. All of them are remarkable. But the most special for me is this man, Robert Kane. This then is his story, but it's also the story of the medal that he won. Mm. In official speak, the military say the Victoria Cross is awarded only for gallantry of the highest order. But what does that mean? Well, let me give you a typical example. This is the story of Lieutenant Ferdinand West, an RAF pilot who won his VC in the First World War. On August the 10th, 1918, West was flying his biplane far over the enemy lines when he was attacked by seven German aircraft. Oh my Lord. At the start of the fight, one of his legs was blown off by an explosive bullet and fell into the controls. West lifted his leg clear of the controls and, although wounded in the other leg, maneuvered his machine so that his rear gunner was able to get several good bursts into the enemy aircraft and drive them off. All seven of them. That's Through oh. sheer grit and determination, West then landed his plane safely and, although rapidly weakening and semi-conscious from the loss of blood, insisted on filing his report on the enemy troop positions before receiving medical attention. That's crazy. That's crazy. Not only did he have to go against seven German air, uh, air defense, or I guess that's how you air, uh, but he got his leg blown off by an explosive bullet. Other leg was wounded, was still able to put that plane in a position to, for the uh, rear gunner to be able to get off several bursts to kind of scare away the German aircraft and run them, all seven of them, run them off, still landed the plane safely, and although he's weakening, and, and I'm sure he's going in and out, he still wants to give his report on enemy position before he gets any medical treatment. My Lord. ...in his report on the enemy troop positions before receiving medical attention. And the extraordinary thing is, the report here filed by his rear gunner said that he didn't know that the pilot had been wounded until after they landed. Oh, my God. West never thought to mention that his leg had been blown off. That's crazy. That's something that, was, that it would take to win that award. The story of the VC the, began 150 cross. years ago when Britain was in the thick of another empire-building dust-up, the Crimean War. Mm. There was huge bravery, but the system for rewarding this gallantry was a shambles. The medals mm. that did exist were only for officers of a certain rank. There was nothing for the common man. Sometimes an ordinary soldier would be mentioned in dispatches, but that was no good because army commanders tended to list everyone who'd taken part. It was a bit like passing your chartered accountancy exams today. You get your name in the paper, but so does everyone else. I see that. The Crimean conflict, however, saw the advent of a new weapon to fight the cause of the foot soldier. 
the war correspondent. One of them was William Howard Russell from the Times. His stories from the front line meant that for the first time, people back home could read accounts about the immense bravery of the bloke next door. <laughs> One of the people who read these reports was Captain Thomas Scoble, an MP, who proposed a motion in the Commons on December the 19th, 1854, that the Queen should create some kind of medal, an order of merit, he said, for distinguished and prominent personal gallantry, to which every grade an individual, from the highest to the lowest, may be admissible. I love that. I love that they came up with this medal, man, because, yeah, you shouldn't have to reach, I, I feel like, a certain rank to be able to, you know what I'm saying? Get a, a, a medal for, for pulling off just one of the bravest actions that, that can be done. You, you shouldn't have to be a certain rank to be able to do that, there, to get that. Uh, and so I absolutely love that. Uh, they, they started giving the medals. Uh, they created a medal to where no matter what rank you are, uh, you're admissible for it. Lowest may be admissible. Unfortunately, the idea met with strong resistance from army commanders. Right. They argued that the success of the British Army was based on the discipline of its wow. formations. And they didn't want a medal that recognised individual acts of heroism in case okay. it encouraged soldiers to break ranks and disappear okay. off on their own. That, that is, um, I, I can't, I still think that I'm glad that they got the medal, but that is understandable. That is an understandable of heroism in case it encouraged soldiers to break ranks and disappear off on their own. However, the top brass was about to be outgunned. Queen, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert saw the sense of Scoble's idea and told the War Office to come up with a plan. Not being terribly adventurous or enthusiastic, the civil servant suggested something traditional, an ancient order of some kind, perhaps. This is the document that they prepared. And as you can see from the notes and the squiggles put on it by Prince Albert, he was less than impressed. You can see here he's crossed out this bit where it refers to the order because he didn't want it to be seen like joining a Masonic lodge. Hmm. Here in the margin, look, he's, he's actually referred to it as a cross, granted for distinguished service, which will make it simple and intelligible. That is very forward thinking for the time. Hmm. And here, he even suggests a name for it. The Victoria Cross. I like that. Nearly a hundred years after Prince Albert wrote those words, Major Robert Kane was preparing to go into battle at Arnhem. He was no career soldier, just an oil company executive from the Isle of Man. So, what sort of chap was he? He was very kind and he had a great sense of humour. I used to drink in the bar. He always bought the drinks. Well, my strongest hey. memory is that you, you hadn't got to be frightened of him. <laughs> that you could go to him and speak to him of anything. I would personally, if I'd been asked to follow anyone, I'd have followed Robert Kane. I had complete confidence in man. I love that. Man. The battle plan that brought Kane to Arnhem was called. Someone, uh, no, no, so someone who it, it relates with their peers and is nice to their peers and who peers love him and he's approachable, he's friendly, he's kind, he's buying drinks uh, at the bars for everybody. Like, that's a man that, that, that you will, you'd be willing to follow into battle, and that's a man that you'd have his back. Uh, so he already sounds awesome. It's a man. The battle plan that brought Kane to Arnhem was called Operation Market Garden, and it was very simple. Allied forces would parachute into Holland and seize a line of strategic bridges. This would create a highway that would allow the second army to charge north over the enemy defense lines and down into Germany itself. Mm. The war, it was said, would be over in a matter of weeks. Now, the most difficult bridge to capture would be the one furthest north in the Dutch city of Arnhem. 
but a small band of British paratroopers from the first wave of landings did manage to capture the north end of what's now known oh. as the Bridge Too Far. Oh, wow. Major Kane arrived in this field 24 hours after the first landings. There'd been a problem with his glider back in England, but his job remained the same. He had to get his company of 22 men to the bridge as fast as possible to help out. Sounds simple, but it wasn't. First of all, the whole point of airborne troops is surprise. You don't know they're coming until they're there. But because Kane arrived 24 hours after the first wave, the surprise was gone. And to make matters worse, the landing zone was some eight miles from the bridge. So, thanks to some incompetent planning from the top brass in England, the Germans knew that Kane and his men were coming, they knew where he'd landed, they knew where he was going, and they had the wherewithal to do something about it. By sheer coincidence, the German army had parked two divisions just outside Arnhem. That meant tanks, artillery guns, half-tracks and 12,000 SS Panzer troops. Lined up against this wall of armour was the airborne British soldier, who, by the nature of his job, travelled light. He only had a stem gun, a rifle, knives, grenades. Only a few anti-tank weapons were brought, cos no-one thought they'd be needed. The British troops simply didn't know about the strength of the German opposition as they started out on the eight-mile walk to the bridge. Kane's men made it with no real problems at all to this very spot, just 2,000 yards from the bridge. They could actually see it over there, and they could almost certainly hear the small company of British soldiers fighting to hold on to the northern end, but they couldn't get there. That's crazy. Yeah, eight, eight miles away, man. Uh, that's crazy. And, yeah, like, the planning, he, he said it was incompetent. Uh, yeah, it's like... There, you, there, there's no element of surprise there anymore. Now the Germans know you're coming. They know where you're landing. They know where you're going to be at. They have these tanks set up, all these troops there. They already have everything prepared and waiting for you. So now you're in a situation where you're at a humongous disadvantage because of whatever plan that was. But they couldn't get there. The Germans had had all the time in the world to get ready, and they were ready. Down there, on the other side of the river, they had artillery. On the other side, up there behind that modern building, there's a piece of high ground. They'd put mortars on that. Oh Dead ahead Lord. were tanks and infantry. In desperation, some of the British tried to run down this bank, but there were more tanks and more infantry down there My on God. the lower road. This was the perfect place for an ambush. The British had walked right into it, and they were slaughtered. Of the 400 South Staffs who fought here, only a hundred would escape. Wow. Kane called it the regiment's Waterloo. Two of his close friends were among the casualties, and in his diary he wrote, For the first time since childhood, tears sprang in my eyes. I turned away, swallowing hard, and with rage in my heart. It must have been a savage kind of rage, because on his way back down this road for more ammunition, he ran into a party of five Germans. And even though he was alone, he opened up with his Bren gun and killed all of them. My God. Later on, the easygoing married father of two wrote of the killings, I cannot describe the surge of dreadful, unholy joy which I felt. When he got back the... When you're going through those things, dude, and you're losing your best friends, you're losing who basically became family, they basically became your brothers, like... Uh, it, it does fill your heart with rage, and you want to take out as many of the enemy as possible. 
and that that kind of stuff it, it it just changes you 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 just can't be the same after after doing that after seeing that and so uh like i said before anybody who's who's willing to stand up and fight for their country man uh that's incredible or anybody who's willing to stand up to evil that's incredible When he got back, the battle scenes were horrific. He wrote, my We passed God. Taffy Williams, a grand little Welshman and one of my originals. Only his head and face were untouched. The rest of him was unrecognisable. And so, with his company decimated, Kane was ordered to retreat. He'd bagged five Germans single-handed, but that made him a soldier, not a hero. There was still no hint that this man would win. A Victoria Cross. This, the world's ultimate medal, was deliberately designed to be simple. In fact, when it was unveiled in 1857, the critics were horrified. The Times called it poor looking and mean in the extreme. I love it. People were used to medals like chandeliers, as big and as glitzy as firework night. It was always assumed that the grander the medal, the brighter it should be. Mm, I understand that. I love the simplistic nature of it. This though. is the actual prototype of the VC, made to Prince Albert's specifications, a simple cross. Now, when Queen Victoria saw it, she loved it. In fact, mm. if we look on a real one, which I've got here, we can see the only change she made is to the bar. She added some laurel leaves and a little V. And that's it. That. The highest award for gallantry. Strangely, the metal from which all VCs are made is not kept at the palace or under the Bank of England. Mm. It's to be found here at an army supply base near Telford in Shropshire. It's in these sinister buildings that the army stores its rifles, its machine guns, its artillery pieces, its nuclear and chemical warfare suits. A quarter of a million items with a combined value of 1.4 billion pounds. Enough to win a small war. Bear in mind that what you're looking at here is just one aisle. And there are eight aisles in every unit. And there are four units in every building. Oh and my there are 20 God. buildings. That's crazy. The security is fearsome. But even so, imagine. the most precious thing they have here is kept in its own safe. A safe with its own alarm and its own all-seeing CCTV camera. Wow. This is it. It's a lump of bronze from a Chinese-made cannon that was captured from the Russians at Sevastopol in the Crimean War. And it's from this lump of metal that all Victoria Crosses are made. peeled from the original lamp and taken by military escort to a tiny jeweler's in London's Burlington Arcade. Mm. Hancock's have made the medal since the day it was created and it's always given their craftsmen a bit of a headache. <laughs> it's made of very insignificant, valueless metal. Mm. The metal itself is, I suppose the right word is unstable. 
Yeah, it's it's something it's something that you'd have to get used to because it, like you, you don't work with that often because they, it, it's so hard to win one. So when you need a new batch, I'm sure it's like it's a long time in between when you need new batches and 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 then he I guess he's explaining the rest of why why it's so hard to the win. metal itself is I suppose the right word is unstable. It it's not nice metal like pure copper or pure silver or pure gold or even pure bronze. It, it comes, as most people seem to know, from cannons which were um, captured. So it's already been used once. And the more often you use it, the less stable it becomes. Mm. Down in the vaults of this jewellers, you will find seven VCs, the last of a batch that was cast over 30 years ago. Wow. They're all unengraved. They're all waiting for an owner. All VCs are going to look alike. Yeah. But what makes them unique, of course, is the information on the back. Okay. The engraving of the man's name and regiment and the date. And until they are issued, they are literally valueless. 1942, 3, 4, that sort of time, um, Hancocks were charging £1.10, £1.50 in in our modern language, mm -hmm. to each of the services. And now, a VC which may have cost those sorts of sums in 1943 could well be worth on the market 150 to 200,000 pounds. It does actually become priceless once it's been issued because it can be identified for a particular man on a particular day in a particular sense. action. And that it's makes the. Sense. But all right, guys, we are going to stop it here for the first part. Uh, I, I, I can't wait to finish this up. Uh, this is definitely, definitely amazing. Uh, and these soldiers are definitely brave. Uh, this was, it was so far. What I, what I've seen so far is very unfortunate that the plan was to, to, uh, I guess try to surprise them by coming through air. But you already did the surprise twenty four hours earlier, so the Germans were prepared and waiting. When tragedy struck. That's all we got for this. You guys got a favorite video suggestion, you can subscribe to Patreon or drop it in the comment section. Subscribe to the channel, ring notification bell, get a video a thumbs up so it gets suggested. Social media and Patreon are all up top. If you want to subscribe to any of it, pull all the links in the description. All you got to do is hit the link, follow me, talk to me. Love talking to you guys. You guys are the most incredible team on YouTube. It's your boy Dino. Out.